Hi everybody and welcome. Sorry we're a couple minutes late getting started here, but uh, this is a webinar between LinkSquares and BreachRx on how to survive a data breach and avoid litigation. My name is Tim Perilla. I'm the Chief Legal Officer at LinkSquares. Um, and uh, today with me I've got Andy Lunsford, who's the CEO of BreachRx. Um, Andy, you want to give a little bit of your background and, and a little bit of information about BreachRx? Yeah, sure. So BreachRx, our mission is to help legal privacy and security teams proactively prepare for, respond to, and recover from privacy and cybersecurity incidents. Uh, we have an automation platform that empowers teams to handle incidents efficiently while meeting all their regulatory and contractual obligations, which ultimately minimizes the risk for handling incidents. Uh, my background, I'm an attorney I've been working in privacy law commercial litigation for about 20 years. Started with the, some of the earliest data breach cases before the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and, you know, over time, really gained a lot of empathy for companies um, just facing the, these incidents and how complex the regulatory environment was. Um, I often talk about people being double victims. So, you know, you're, if you compared this to like having your house broken into, it would be like, okay, your house gets broken into, you lose a bunch of valuables from the burglar, and then the police come and take you to jail or fine you. <laughs> and that's kind of the dynamic that you live in when it comes to a data breach. Um, so anyway, we, we found ReachRx to help companies manage these crises and to really turn them into routine business processes just because privacy incidents and data breaches are going to happen. They're, they're really a kind of an endemic problem for, for everybody. Awesome. Awesome. And how, how long have you guys been in business? And uh, I know you're distributed, but where are some of your, uh, your main employee bases? Yeah, we're yeah we're fully distributed. We we were founded in uh, 2018, um, so we're in both Washington D.C. and San Francisco. So kind of a bicoastal are our key areas, but yeah, we've got people all over. There are worse places to have footprints than uh, D.C. and yeah. SF. So maybe <laughs> hopefully we can get you to come to Boston too and open up something here. So yeah, yeah, I would love to. I haven't been to Boston in years. So it would be fun to get back. Awesome. Well, uh, well, let's let's get into it. So we've got a couple of things that we're going to uh, that we're going to walk through here. Uh, just a quick agenda. We're going to go through some stats. Then we'll do a quick uh, tabletop exercise, kind of in a bridge version. Look at some results and a couple of steps. Uh, give you some action items, and then we also encourage throughout uh, to use the chat functionality to type in any questions you may have. Uh, we'd love for this to be as interactive as possible. And um, uh, both Andy and I doing these types of things before I've experienced that um, you know depending on depending on the audience and makeup and what brought you here uh, there are going to be different parts throughout this uh, throughout the webinar that you're going to want us to focus a little bit more on so um, please don't be shy ask questions and we'll um, and we'll 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 take those in real time too so awesome and Andy yeah. maybe I'll uh, I'll turn it over to you from here for uh, for a couple of slides yeah, sounds good. So um, I think probably people get a sense of this from just the news headlines, but basically we continue to see more and more record-breaking number of attacks. One was more than the previous year. Um, and, uh, you know, there also the cost is going up. So if you look at um, this Ponemon study that um, they do with, with IBM every year, they study what's the cost of a data breach. And um, that also increases every year. And um, you know, this last year is 4.24 4 million. And what's important to know is that in that study, that's not that's actually excluding the mega breaches. I think oftentimes people are like, oh, that's just because you have an Equifax type of breach and that just makes them all, brings all of them up. But they actually limit these uh, breaches they study to 100,000 records or less. Um, so those pretty much are all the ones you wouldn't see about in the news. Um, so anyway. That's remarkable. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, and it's really um, unfortunate. You know, I think what, what's got happened here is it's a lot of this is because the regulatory landscape has gotten so complicated. The you know, legal work that happens, you know, we call the long tail of a breach, um, just continues to grow um, what those responsibilities are. So, you know, Gartner took out this study, and I think we've all seen this, is that, you know, by 2023, 75% of the world population will, will be living in an area that has uh, some kind of privacy regulation. Um, and most of these regulations, um, when it comes to data breaches, are, are all about what is the timeline that you need to notify. So GDPR was sort of a tipping point with 72 hours. 
Um, and then if you don't notify on time, what's the penalty? And you know, it used to be something that, that companies could feel like more of a slap on the wrist, but now you're talking about percentages of revenue as the, the way that um, they come after companies. Like I think in, kind of insane in Singapore, they, um, their penalty is 10% of revenue. I mean, it's just it, it's mind boggling. Yeah. Um, so in 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 those cases, and I know we're kind of a, a little bit off script here, but in those cases, uh, does it also preclude uh, private causes of action? Um, it's a mix. You know, I think that some 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 company some countries um, allow for that private right of action, um, and that's a really big debate in the U.S. on the on the federal um, law. I think there's. You know, a lot of this community that wants to have that um, preclusion in it um, and also just to get out the sort of sectoral approach we have in the United States where every U.S. state has its own regulation um, just to give companies an easier time um, with here's one standard let's just follow the one standard and, and know it. Yeah absolutely. Um, so yeah a couple other just on this the more recent uh, oriented regulations which was the, the critical infrastructure a bill that we saw actually get passed with bipartisan support. You know, it, it includes a 72-hour notification. It has um, also an even faster notification if it's a ransom payment, 24 hours. And you also, what's also interesting on that one, you have to update every, I think it's 48 hours or something like that, um, the status of your incident. So it's just, it's kind of a, an ongoing burden. Um, and then India most recently came out with this six-hour <laughs> notification. It's like, you know, do you, how can you even, um, figure anything out that that fast, especially if you're in a company of any type of size. But um, I know I think from the contract perspective, you know, that means, you know, if you've got to meet these timelines and you're, you're sharing your data with a vendor, you've got to make those timelines even shorter. Otherwise, you have no shot at actually you know, completing those deadlines on time. That's right. That's right. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to jump into the, the incident here in a second. We just you know, kind of give you the framework when you're thinking about incidents. It's all about these, you know, three areas. You prepare, how can you practically be ready for this so that when you, when you're, you get to responding to an incident, you can move quickly. And ultimately, it's all about how can you continue to improve this process going forward. Um, so that's that's how we get it. Okay, Tim, so let, let's let's dive in here. Um, all right. Set the stage. Um, in this scenario, we'll imagine you're the GC of a fintech company called Back Office Banking, or Bob for short. Um, Bob is not a consumer facing app, but it, but they uh, provide big banks with um, diligence uh, abilities with consumer loans, mortgages, et cetera. So basically Bob holds a lot of sensitive consumer information like social security numbers, uh, account numbers, financial information, et cetera. Um, so Tim, are, are you planning to take a vacation this summer? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, wife and I have plans to go to the Bahamas. Really looking forward to it. Awesome. Well, um, imagine you're on the way to the airport. You're you're actually sitting there. You've gotten through security. You're waiting to board your flight. And uh, your CISO calls you and she says, hey, Tim, I, I know you're about to get on a long flight, but I wanted to give you the heads up. Um, we just got a direct message into our company Twitter account. Um, some user called um, Vacation Hater 2022. Um, and he claims to have broken into um, and pulled down our entire consumer database we use for consumer loan diligence. Um, this Twitter user says he's going to go public with this information if we don't pay him $25 million. Um, you know, we, we haven't really confirmed this yet. We've got, we're starting to dog, dive into our logs um, and we'll give you a more update. Um, so, so Tim, you're there and you're thinking, oh gosh, do I, um, you know, not go on my vacation or do I, do I go ahead and get on the flight? Since you've lived through COVID and everybody's gotten remote, you're like, well, my hotel has Wi-Fi that's high speed, so I can uh, I can figure it out if I need to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're so you've got some time to think when you get in the air, Tim. So what's going through your mind? Um, you know, other than maybe your vacation's been run. <laughs> well, I, uh, I I call my staff and tell them to cancel their vacations uh, first. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, uh, obviously, um, obviously, there's there's immediate questions around scope. Uh, number number one is you know is the claim actually actually accurate, right? Can we can we 
have we done what we need to do to verify whether there was actually any access or not? Um, ideally, uh, uh, and I would imagine if we're if we're handling this type of information, we would have sophisticated enough systems to be able to tell that data was in fact accessed and you know from some unknown uh, some unknown quantity, right? Some unknown right. entity. Um, and so as soon as that's verified, I would want to understand the entire scope of what has actually been accessed, right? Was it really the entire customer database? Was it just a subset that was held in, you know, maybe in, in um, you know, some shorter term storage that we have, but they didn't get into sort of the cold storage for uh, retention that we had to deal with or anything like that. So really try to get an idea of the size and scope and, uh, of, of the breach, assuming that the breach actually happened or this person was actually able to, to, to access and, and gather this information. From there, uh, from there, I would, I would absolutely start looking into, um, uh, looking into what my contractual obligations are with, um, you know, with, with the bank at issues where, you know, we're a B2B helping, um, uh, right, it was right. It was a B2B organization that uh, helps do customer loan diligence, right? So I would I would absolutely be looking at that contract with with my customers, what my obligations are in terms of notification. Um, I would also be looking at um, what uh, what my notification requirements are from an insurance perspective, and then I would yeah. also look at it from a regulatory perspective. And then, um, and then sort of put all of those inputs into something that I can easily access and, re and refer to. Nice. Well, I, I pulled up um, the ReachRx platform here to kind of give a visual as we walk through the, the um, incident. So you know, jumping in, you mentioned contracts. Um, we'll go look at a, a sample contract here um, in the platform for Bigly Bank. Um, and if you look at this, the um, you know bank incident trigger is is around whether it you know does it meet the the level of incident for them um, has it actually occurred you know in this case there's a condition on whether it's confirmed suspected or possible um, and if it is a confirmed or suspected incident which I know it's kind of crazy suspected incident like what that's like a very low low bar but right. in this case bank because they're you know had total leverage on you when you were you know getting these contracts on they want a one hour deadline that's just um pretty pretty tough <laughs> yeah yeah uh, absolutely and i you know i think but but that's a good thing to know right because right. usually when you see notification provisions that look like that and i think you know probably in the details uh in the details there that you can pull up um, I think you'd probably end up seeing that uh, that there needs to be some initial level of notification within you know within that that immediate amount of time. Uh, even if it's hey we have an incident that uh, that we're working through we need we need some more time to get details. But you know we've done A B C D and E so far right something yeah. something like very can just hey we're on it we've got it covered. Um, right. And that also that also goes a long way when we sort of skip forward to avoiding litigation. When you're in a B2B context like this, communicating with your uh, with your customers is really really important. Um, and doing doing so in a transparent but factual way is also really important. Yeah, totally totally agree. Um, so next, I pulled up here that you, you mentioned the cyber insurance, and I think that's one piece that um, I find from like, talking to our customers sometimes. Is not as well uh, um, understood as, as you would want to be when this stuff happens. So a lot of people have come in with a mindset of, okay, well I can um, take care of this incident and all the responsible work, and then I just go to insurance. Hey, this is what I spent. Can you can you reimburse me? Um, but that's not really the way it works. They're uh, they want to have notification often before you even notify anybody, um, and you know, then they want to be very involved into your process. So um, the advice I give a lot of our customers is that you kind of need to make a call at the beginning. Um, is this, does this feel like, or is it showing up to be an incident that you think is going to exceed, um, is going to get to that you're really going to want insurance coverage? Because if it's not, if it's more minor, it's a lot to engage them. You might risk your, your insurance rates going up, which are then skyrocketing for a lot of people. Um, and so like in this case, um, 
at this threshold was okay. They give a 50k deductible essentially, and um, you know, if the costs go over 100k, then you want to go ahead and involve them and, and start having them. Um, so another piece, I don't know how how much time you spent Tim with um, cyber insurance policies, but another piece that people are less aware of is oftentimes ransomware specifically called out. Um, you know, because that's what we see about in the news all the time. And it'll say, if you can communicate to the adversary that you have insurance, that that's a right. reason to preclude your Yeah, We have zero dollars in the bank account, but we do have a $5 million policy ransom, folks. So uh, how yeah. much should it be? <laughs> yeah, so you can guess, like, what's, what's the ransom they're going to ask for? Um, <laughs> and uh, what? Strangely, it would align probably pretty directly with the uh, amount of insurance coverage. Yeah, and I think that's another piece is you don't realize that that actually when an adversary comes in, sometimes that's the first thing they want to go find is because they know that's what the, the pocket number is. So like you don't think of your insurance policy as being a crown jewel to protect like you do like your IP and some consumer data, but you really need to be careful with your insurance policy because that is exactly <laughs> what, what they want to be. Um, and it gives them like a, a tactical advantage when, when it comes to negotiating. Yeah. Um, so let's look just at a regulation real quick. Um, you know, we'll maybe jump into, since you're a uh, Boston guy, we'll go into Massachusetts. Um, often we see like, okay, you've got to decide, was this data accessed or acquired? But that's kind of like one of the initial pieces, some of the state regs have it just on whether it was access, some of them have to be acquired, or some of them it's both. Um, and, you know, there, there's a lot of different types of exceptions. So like you can see here, like this one, you're going to be doing a good faith analysis as to whether the action was done in good faith. And then there's also a risk of harm. Like if, if this information gets out, what's it going to um, do to the consumer? Um, but, um, yeah. One of the interesting things on that as far as access and and again, we're, you know, I don't mean to be divulging sort of off script a, a little bit too yeah. much, diverting off script a little too much, but the, the aspect of uh, data being accessed is really interesting. And it's a lot, a lot more common than, than people might think, because you, um, a lot of times what you'll have are people who are trying to verify passwords for other more important things, right? People will use yeah. their passwords for like 10 or 15 different accounts. And like maybe you provide like, you know, a, a username and, and password uh, and you collect um, you collect someone's home address and their first and last name, okay? Something like that, because you're like a, some sort of a marketing company and they could get like X dollars off on gasoline or whatever. And now all of a sudden you have a group of hackers who are actually trying to get verifiable passwords and they're coming in and just, they don't really care about that person's address or the information that you have. They know it, but they assume that since you're just doing like a marketing thing, your security is not going to be like what it is at a bank. So they'll go in and they'll try to run these and get username and password combinations and get massive lists of those and then go try to verify them across other, uh, across other organizations. Um, uh, that are that are increasingly more secure and then the more sort of the more verifiable passwords that they can get these people don't even go into like once they do get into your banking they don't even, they don't want to take the risk of going and actually stealing that money so they're turning around they're selling those lists to somebody else and they're taking their money off the top so yeah when you talk about like oh why would why would it just be accessed and not acquired it actually is extremely common that that happens yeah yeah yeah, I completely agree. And the way they can basically use bots and AI to just run those things, it's not like they're logging in and putting those in individually. They can do test all of them like in, in seconds, basically. Yeah, exactly. And bouncing them off of servers all over the world, alternating with certain speeds and all of that. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild stuff they can do. Yeah. Well, let's let's jump over to the, the incident um, and see what your your team has figured out while you're you were in the air. Um, looks like um, they've gone through the logs and it does appear like there's some kind of discrepancy here that something may have happened during the, the recent product update. Yep. 
Um, so not not the news you were hoping to hear <laughs> when you landed, <laughs> but. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you're still at this stage. You may know that there's that discrepancy, but there's still more um, more work to do, right? So um, yeah, it's important at this point to really be able to spring into action and have people moving. Right. Um, yep. So yeah, so like, yeah, but go go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. I, I, I was just gonna say the you, know, you want to assign people from your team to start working on. Yeah, exactly. I mean, start looking at start looking at these tasks and um, and figure out okay, who who on the team really needs to be managing this? And um, you know, you think about you think about somebody from the team doing security oriented tasks, right? Yeah, Kelly will do that, and and then we have this good faith and risk of harm analysis that we can assign over to Charlie, um, yeah. you know, and and so on and so forth, and just continue continue down the line so that everybody who's sort of in your incident response team is aware of what they need to be doing. Right. Totally. Um, so just to, because we're on a, a short timeline, I'm going to jump ahead to a little bit, fast forward in time a little bit where there's a little bit more known about the incident. Um, so, so at this point, um, your team has covered a lot more details. So they've figured out specific data types that were involved um, and some of the geographic information. It looks like a boatload of states here. Um, information does appear maybe is accessed and acquired. Um, and so as a result, you can see the, the number of tasks that the team has in front of them um, is quite voluminous. <laughs> um, exactly. So, and yeah. and being able to being able to think about that in terms of in terms of jurisdiction is really really helpful too, um, particularly if you if you're an organization that is fortunate enough to have or maybe maybe unfortunate enough to to have a stable of uh, of local council in various jurisdictions, it's going to be really helpful to start to task uh, uh, task people with reaching out to those attorneys uh, to go through the notification process. Um, you know, should you choose to uh, to farm that out rather than do that internally? Yeah, I think a lot of um, you know non-lawyers, like business folks, um, don't fully appreciate that you're actually subject to all of these different um, laws, even if you're you don't have a headquarters there. Like, you know, I think there's often this assumption, like, well, my my office is located in San Francisco, so I only need to worry about um, CCPA in California, I don't need to worry about all these other ones. Um, but actually, if you have any customer data for people residing in any of these other geographies, that's what really triggers it. And so I think there's often a lot of education that <laughs> needs to happen for, for business units to understand like the, the full scope here. Yeah, there there absolutely is. And it so so maybe maybe we could take just a quick step back. One thing that I that I think um I, I may have I may have missed. Um, I know we had a handful of in, in the overview uh, and in the conversation section here. We have uh, ways to centralize communication. And you know, Andy, uh, for for you, maybe this is a question for you. How are you know how are you thinking about uh, the preservation of attorney-client privilege, and how can you help to train? Um, to train the folks on your incident response team to be cognizant of that, and how can you use the platform to help um, to help manage that communication? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and it's a top of mind issue every time an incident happens. Um, how are you going to handle the attorney client privilege? And it's so critical that you're thinking about that before the incident happens, because trying to implement oh this is how we're going to communicate. Um, you know, when you're in the thick of it, it, it's really hard to get your arms around it. And as I've seen the, the downstream effects, you know, the communication from non-attorney to non-attorney about, oh, we should have done this patch months ago, but this kind of thing has become smoking guns, A, B, and C in, in court. Um, and unfortunately, we've just had a rash of tough uh, <laughs> opinions by the different federal courts that are 
really making it harder on companies to protect this information. So they're saying like, hey, if you're doing this work in a tool that you use for other business purposes, like, you know, name, name your product, Slack teams, whatever, um, you're mixing in a lot of factual information with the with some of the legal advice. And so you can't, it used to be like, okay, well maybe we have this blanket coverage because we had an attorney involved or outside counsel was overseeing it. Um, but they're saying, hey, no, that the other side needs to have facts. And so if you don't have it bifurcated, um, you're gonna have to turn it over. And so it's it's really come out in a lot of, uh, specifically around forensic reports. But um, so what we're doing in the platform is, is being much more intentional about that and saying, hey, let's keep privileged um, sense of communications over here in this conversations area. Um, apart from where you're actually carrying out the actions and building that record, because at the same time, you know, you have to be able to prove you take the right actions at the right time. Um, and so you, so you can't just say, well, I'm not going to give you anything. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, at, at some point, you know, you, you need to, and I think the, uh, the crux of a lot of those opinions are, uh, yeah, there's sort of the general purpose. Well, you can't hide facts under the guise of attorney-client privilege, right? Um, right. For, for those types of things. And so, really, it's okay. How am I, you know, how am I working with the team to manage that that communication in in the right way? And I think, you know, when when I think about this stuff, it's it starts, you know, it starts in in training, right? Uh, the first first thing that we brought up there is plan, right? How are we planning? And, yeah. um, you know, I, th I think for, uh, for anybody who is working on putting together an incident response plan, looking at, um, looking at a different tool, if this is front of mind for you, then you absolutely should be identifying relevant team members and then I, uh, and then communicating with them, uh, on how they should communicate together. Right. Um, a lot of times you have engineering teams and they just need to be able to communicate and they communicate well over Slack. And, you know, the, the idea of them all just getting on a Zoom call and doing something verbally is just not workable in most circumstances. Um, if it is, it's going to make things probably last a whole lot longer than they need to, uh, which is not great. So being able to train up, um, train up those folks on, on what the attorney client privilege and more importantly, uh, what it is and more importantly what it isn't is um, you know is is something that that any responsible in-house attorney should should be doing yeah and it's another piece too that I think is helpful is to think about okay if we did have a, a ransomware situation or um, a lot of times from a security perspective you've got to take all the systems down so if, yes. if all the systems are down, then what's your out-of-band communication? Um, in, a, in a worst case, one time uh, we saw one company, they didn't know that their email had been compromised and um, the adversary was actually in there reading all their emails and they um, set up a, their daily stand-up to talk through the incident and uh, they actually showed it up, right, the ransomware actually showed up on the conference call and uh, put for more money. <laughs> Not, not good. Oh my gosh, that's awful. It's like, <laughs> I mean, it's funny, but it's not funny. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, so maybe we probably should no. jump back to the. I know we don't. We have abbreviated time to get through this this yeah. incident. So, um, kind of highlighting here in this case, you know, I think we were showing in this conversation there was to talk about whether the data was encrypted. Like obviously it's a best practice to get, have your data encrypted. Um, here we're seeing that the team thought that everything was encrypted, but the encrypted keys might also be exposed. Um, and so what I think important, in it, and it's also something when the value of doing this kind of tabletop with, with your team is that you can see that like, hey, it's worth investing some effort and doing some of these things around how we store our data and use it. So like if I were to, switch this over to say, hey, this data was actually encrypted, all of a sudden you're going to reduce the number of tasks dramatically yeah. because many, many states have um, you know, a exception. If the data is encrypted, then um, you don't you don't have to notify. Um, but it obviously can, can drive your, your legal costs down pretty substantially. Yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome. That's a great point. Um, 
and it it can cut your task list down so meaningfully. Yeah, and yeah. costs. What's what's your task list? The task list starts to decrease. You can see the dollars start to decrease too. Yes, yes, yeah, and just the disruption. Because you think about your team, um, they have a normal like full time job doing other activities. Like even like your your legal team. It's probably you need to be processing sales contracts or M and A deals or whatever work that the legal team is normally getting through that are helping generate revenue for the company. Um, if you're the longer you're sidetracked with this, um, the less time you can spend on actually generating revenue for the company. I think that's another way to kind of get executive buy-in on it too. Is like, hey, we need we need to devote some resources here because if all of a sudden the whole legal department shut down for three months. What what, is, what what do we do as company? Right, exactly, exactly. And uh, and I would imagine if there's that much work, you probably have an army of outside attorneys too. It's tough. So right, right. Yeah. yeah. And once that meter's turned on, it is uh, it adds up pretty quick. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, uh, so I think just because we got we want to make room for Q and A and um, also. Um, just to get through a little, few more slides of some of the takeaways for people, we'll just fast forward and say, um, here's what ended up happening. Let me let me just switch over to the slides. Um, basically, um, fast forward in time, you um, were able to get cyber insurance involved. They um, hired a ransom negotiator, communicate with the adversary to, to prove. Um, you know, part of his first step was having him prove that they actually exfiltrated the data, um, and you were able to figure out with the negotiator that they actually didn't have any of the encrypt, you know, encryption keys, and so this data is all encrypted. It's not going to do anything for them. They can't present. You know, it's just basically useless. So no need to pay ransom, um, but you did obviously have some exposure. So there was some notifications have to go out to you know organizations like or um, regulators like New York. Department of Financial Services, um, those banks that had those very strict um, quick quick timelines, but uh, thankfully not not the big the big negative could have looked like it could have been. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, so we we did a survey um, before the um, uh, webinar and had, had a fair number of people respond. Maybe you want to run through these, Tim. Yeah, absolutely happy to. So, um, you know, 60% said that the company has been part of an incident and 40% say they use spreadsheets or manual processes to manage these types of incidents. Um, or they, they are planning on using spreadsheets or manual processes. 40% um, prepare for uh, incidents through uh, tabletop exercises um, that can run the gamut of, uh, you know, varying levels of complexity and surprise. Um, and then 20% are unsure if they have a system in place to manage incidents, um, which, you know, to, to me actually sounded a little bit low. Um, yeah. You know, may, maybe it's just sort of the nature of, of the profile, but, um, you know, most most IT teams that, that I'm aware of have some sort of a response out there. And, uh, you know, to think that 80% of the, legal teams out there are aware of what their IT teams, IT teams are doing, I think is probably um, optimistic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think there's, there's definitely a, and maybe it's just the legal training of, you never want to admit to doing something that would look like a liability or negative, um, but you, kind of, you think it's more buttoned up and it, until you get thrown into an incident and you're like, oh my gosh, uh, <laughs> I wish I, and spend a little more time focused on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, I think look, yeah, this this is great. You get into the preparation. Um, you know, I, I know I alluded to it a little bit um, earlier, but when 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 you're thinking about uh, the potential for a data breach, you really first have to start with the data that you have. Right. Um, in the example that I gave, you know, maybe you're a marketing company, username, password, email, and uh, you know, first last name, home address, something like that. 
versus versus the bank, you know, that's that's underwriting residential mortgages, right? Something like that. Um, you, you really should understand what uh, what the exposure is given the kind of data that you have, and then um, and, and then also quantity, right? Yeah. Um, obviously, if you're if you're a massive massive organization that has millions of of customers, and you're going to have to really understand the location of that data, and, and you know I think you, you're going to want to. You're going to want to be proactive in the way that you work with with your security information security team and probably your your product team as well uh, because you have both application level data that in in some cases can be uh, uh, can be be subject to some of these privacy provisions um, and that maybe is collected and stored in one particular way. A lot of people on AWS and what you know what does that look like? Uh, versus, you know, uh, versus some of the other more financial-based information that might be stored some, somewhere else. Um, so really, really having a thorough understanding of all of the information that that your company has is is, is critical. And from there, it allows you to make risk-based decisions, right? Um, next is, uh, you know, know what's in your contracts. And you know, this is. Uh, I work for a contract management company, and and this is something that we um, that we out of the box are uh, the Link Squares AI out of the box pulls um, pulls a bunch of provisions around uh, data breach. You know, um, oh. notice periods. It pulls. Uh, it can do full clause extraction, things like that as well, and um, allows you to run reports on that. So if you say, all right, show me every every customer that I have that. Uh, where, where there's there's a contractual provision related to a data breach. I also want to know what my required spot response time is, and I also want to be able to see the full clause itself. Yeah. And I also want to see the definition of what is you know what is data that's subject to the security uh, the security responsibilities because uh, not all data would be. Maybe it's just you know so like defined you know defined like personal data or defined whatever. Um, so I, I also want to see the full, you know, I want to see the full text extraction and be able to look through that and do that in a report so I can, you know, narrow down from 100,000 to maybe 30,000 uh, potential, right. you know, potential customers or whatever it may be. Um, so having having something uh, that you can use to, to actually prepare and help inform what your responses will look like is really critical. And then, you know, obviously, we went through went through the tabletop exercise, and I mean, uh, Andy, I think BreachRx, uh, you you've just done a great job putting together a product that really hits on the strong points of what what you need to prioritize as an organization that's going through what is, for for many attorneys, probably some of the more challenging parts of their career. Yeah, the uh, I totally echo everything you're saying. You know, a lot of there's been a lot of focus. The first point you're making about knowing your data, um, do data mapping, and I think these privacy regulations that also contain data breach notification options, there's a, a whole deal about where data is moving, and so that often that's the reason people have started to do a data map. But I think you really need to understand the downstream and impact here with incidents with that data too, both from the regulation geography that where the data is lit, um, the customers involved, but also as it's tied to your contracts. So like you said, like okay, if this you know, database gets hit. What your customers are in it. You know, what what are what are those? Gonna, what is that going to mean and translate to your contracts? And so, having an incident management solution in place that has all that captured already um, is actually going to make it easier to meet these like crazy short timelines that are like 24 hours or <laughs> one hour. In 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 that case, we saw before. Um, and I think you know the important thing here is you. This is such a you know all consuming issue whenever you have one going on. And so really having those relationships built with all the players ahead of time, like, no, hey, this is what your responsibility is going to be when an incident happens. Because um, I think a lot of times people only think about security dealing with incidents um, or they think, oh, sometimes legal is involved. But really you get corporate communications involved. You you get, um, you know, the C-suite needs to know about this. The board needs to know about it. There's public statements that have to be made. Um, so really, you know, the business units themselves that are have those relationships with those customers, 
Um, all those people all of a sudden have a lot of responsibilities that can come along with an incident um, that most people don't don't figure out until they do a tabletop. Yeah, it, exactly, exactly. And you know, I would say that as part of that preparation, those tabletop exercises are are pretty critical to do on an ongoing basis. And and it's um, you know, it, it's it's you know, success through repetition in a lot of ways. What you'll see is um, you know, people uh, people will be less panicked, and yeah. that will be reflected in the way that people communicate about it. Right? Uh, if you, if you've been there before. Uh, then it's a lot easier to to be able to sort of command and control what needs to what needs to be done, um, and so that that continuing um, that continuing uh, real life exercise is uh, you know I think it's absolutely critical for the preparation of the team, and and it's just going to put you in a better position when eventually um, you you have some level of data breach. Yeah, I think that's a good segue to, you know, the respond part, like being able to have specific tasks for people to do and knowing like, hey, this is the responsibility you own um, is really makes a huge difference when it comes to responding effectively and, and meeting your obligations. I think that um, sometimes, sometimes an incident response plan um, you know, has been created to check a box and it just has like people's names, titles and contact information and maybe a, an outside counsel mentioned, but it doesn't actually give you actionable steps to take. It still leaves you with this kind of scrambling of like, what do we do? And so I think that's again, another reason why you want to really be proactively prepared and have some of that muscle memory, having worked through the, the, the incidents with your team before. Yep, absolutely. and. You know, for the uh, for the forty percent that manage this with Excel spreadsheets and some other some some other uh, very manual type of process, um, you know, maybe that's okay for for today, uh, or maybe that's okay for a very small incident. But rest assured, you're you're pretty exposed. The more successful yeah. you be. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Um, so another piece here, yeah, knowing your, your insurance requirements, I think that we've kind of touched on that already, but um, again, there are very specific things you need to follow. And so that really should be baked into your incident response plan. But what are the decision points when we need we decide to bring in insurance, cyber insurance or not? Um, do you want to you know, blanketly notify them every time and say, okay, well, that might mean our, our rates are going to be higher or do you want to do it? You know, say okay. When we know these things have happened, and it's really actually to a level that we should have. Um, but if you miss those timelines, and you really jeopardize your the coverage that you you've been paying for. Yeah, exactly. So as as we get into you know how to how to best manage a data breach, you know what is what is this recover and you know and avoid litigation, um, you know. Andy, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, but I'll just real quickly on mine. I think number one is relationships, and you know, I think you look at it from a B two B perspective, um, and if you can manage the relationship with with the affected partner or partner as well, um, then I mean, listen, it's not gonna it's not gonna mean it's gonna be a pleasant situation, but um, you know, it, it it's going to avoid conflict. Uh, hopefully um, to a large extent and when I say conflict I mean like conflict that the courts have to sort out right <laughs> uh, I'd much rather sort it out on, on my own without having to uh, having to go through that process over the course of what probably is going to be many many months if not years depending on the level of sophistication of the parties um, and, and and the incident itself but managing those relationships I think is really important um, and you know, it just as kind of like an insider tip that I would give to um, that I would give to the folks, you know, the folks viewing today is if you're if you're a general counsel or if you're a chief privacy officer or whatever, you know, whatever your title is, where this is something that's on your radar, I would identify the people wh whose data you hold the most of and just build a relationship, right? Just go, just yeah. 
you want to go out and visit your major customers and say, hey, listen, I'd love to take you out to love to take you out to, to lunch or dinner or grab a drink or whatever it is or a cup of coffee or whatever on some regular cadence and you know had trade uh, you know you probably both lawyers go trade some war stories get to know each other like build that relationship so that no one's hesitant to pick up the phone and be like hey what's going on right. that'll, yeah. that'll save you a lot um, yeah. that'll, that'll save you more than probably any contract management uh, <laughs> or any breach management software is going to save you um, I would say just being completely honest about it, but um, but but that's how that's how I would really focus and be proactive here to truly avoid litigation. If you're in the B2C space, which I was for many many years, um, it's a little bit harder. <laughs> yeah, plaintiffs plaintiffs bar. Um, yeah, it, you gotta eat too. So, uh, but but you manage that maybe in a different way. Uh, it's it's more managing the litigation at that point than it is avoiding that. So, right, yeah, I think the relationships is, are so key. It's like if you're calling somebody for the first time to tell them, you know, you've never talked to them before, and you're like, hey, I, I got to tell you, we had a, a breach with your data. Um, you, know, you have no idea what direction that's going to go. But if you built a relationship, as you said, um, you know, and you talked to them before, they know you. Like, it, they're just going to be a little more understanding and work with you on, you know, next steps. Um, same with the regulators too. I think a lot of, especially as you grow as a company and you're bigger, um, really getting to know your, your regulators. And so that it's, you know, they know that you're proactively trying to have the best, you know, program you can do this type of thing. Um, and then they're less likely to throw the book at you when, when something happens. Um, I think another piece that is, important to understand that's a little more tactical is that you're ultimately going to need to be able to prove you took the right actions at the right time. So like when you think about that, like, okay, if I have to prove that I notified within 72 hours or within 24 hours, what do I, what am I doing to ensure that I've got that documented in a, in a way that, you know, an auditor is going to, it's going to hold up to say, okay, this is a, this is a single source of truth. And, um, and he, here, here's when all this stuff happened. Um, and that, that's you know one of our you know key fundamental focuses in our platform is to be able to do that to people. Um, and then I think that it's all about process um, improvement. Like you go through a tabletop like this, what were the you know what were the pain points when you realized oh when I was prepared I wouldn't didn't really know what to do and this part of it happened. Um, you know we see there's kind of three different types of tabletops people do. They do um, a bit purely like security technology oriented one where it's like you know uh, you know, somebody like Mandy comes in and it's just like injecting all these technical security teams working through it. Then there's the type that's much more senior leadership oriented, like more similar to what we did, where it's okay, here's some new facts. What are you going to decide? Are you going to pay this ransom or you're not? Like, what do you, what, what's the escalation look like? Um, and then the other types of mixing those two together. Um, but that takes, you know, a huge amount of time for people. So, I, kind of, I always recommend it's good to do the full scale sometimes, but you, if you can at least do these like more chunk, smaller pieces um, on some kind of cadence, you know, that's quarterly, um, that can really go a long way in, in uh, being prepared when stuff happens. Yeah, absolutely. That's I, all all excellent points. And and when you know, it's it's interesting just having been through a, a number of different types of audits in my career. Um, when you have your your documentation in order when you have your um your actions actually clearly laid out and and um it looks it looks and is really really well organized it makes the audit go in a very very positive direction in most cases cool. right even if it's not right. a positive even if it's not a positive result because sometimes things happen and the results are not good and you have to deal with that. Like that, it just, that's life. It is what it is. You manage the incident to the best of your ability. And this is something that it's, you know, it, it it's something that I, that I harp on a lot when I, when I uh, talk to a lot of different GCs, particularly people who are first time GCs at, um, at like emerging tech companies and stuff like that is, um, you know, maybe his first in-house counsel is, do not, do not, do not neglect the quality, the the impact of quality organizational skills. 
as a department and emphasizing that and making that a, a, a part of, of your regular operating procedures, right? There's I, countless attorneys that I talk to and countless executives that I talk to say like, yeah, my, my legal department took, it took me, you know, it took me like three weeks to try to put together a due diligence locker for a financing. It's like, all right, but that, that's insane. Like, <laughs> you, it should, I mean, it's realistic and it happens because you're oftentimes your first in-house attorney, you're, you're understaffed. Organization is something that, you know what, you can try to make up for later. I, I really discourage that. Uh, sometimes it, it has to happen, right? But, um, but in, in the audit scenario, this is not one where you want to say, I'll deal with it later because it, it can make make those audits a lot more painful than they need to be having and having a tool that you know like 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 yours andy that is able to provide that sort of organized a streamlined way of responding and managing tasks is um is invaluable for sure um so i know we've just got a couple of minutes left we had a couple of questions in throughout the course um and uh one interesting one, Andy, that I wanted to pose to you. Um, I mean, just given you know, given your career and uh, uh, even before ReachRx and now in the last four years um, with ReachRx here, what are some of the key performance indicators that you can use to measure the progress of managing the incident while the incident is actually still going on? Like, how how can you say? You know, listen. I know it's going to take us many weeks to get through all of this. It's a major, you know, Equifax uh, scale situation. Um, how do I know if my team is doing what they need to be doing? What what can we track? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is um, time oriented. I mean, is, is the is the deal like the longer it takes to get certain pieces done? The more expensive it's going to be, whether that's a productivity loss because that person is spending time on the incident internally that um, could be spent on revenue generating activities like getting getting deals done, um, or it could be that that's out, outside council spend that continues to to ratchet up. And so um, most of the KPIs are around okay, how how quickly you have know, the security team? It's like okay, what's the you know mean time to discover the the incident? For, um, when, how, how quickly did we get closed or how quickly did we get the person eradicated, et cetera, because for them, those dwell times are, are important. And then from, from legal perspective, it's like, okay, when these type of incidents happen, how quickly did it get escalated directly to the, the legal team to, to analyze it? And once they had that information, how quickly were they able to determine what are the regulatory and contractual obligations I have um, and, and then able to execute on on that. Um, and so you can do that also in a thing shop too, but um, when you're, especially as you grow as a, as a company, like you just get to a volume of incidents, you know, some of these top financials that we work with, they have literally, you know, more than a thousand incidents a month. And so, you know, they really have to, to watch these <laughs> these metrics um, because the cumulative, you know, matters when it like stuff scales. Um, I don't think that answered the question for the person that asked. Yeah, yeah, I I would say so. Um, yeah, and then being able to track being able to track performance over time across multiple incidents and um, uh, is probably something also that I would really want to see. We have one here. Um, would using a VPN create a presence in other jurisdictions? Um, <laughs> I mean, my one thing that that I would say is. Um, and and this is us based would be that it's not necessarily where you are it's where the person whose data you hold is right yeah. like i could have zero footprint in the state of new jersey okay and i still could find myself with some obligations in in new jersey if i have a large enough customer base yeah yeah, I think it's the totally the key. Yeah, it's thinking of where are the customers located with the data you have. I think that's a lot, why a lot of people don't realize that they're actually subject to something like GDPR because they have some EU customers or EU customers come to your website and and are getting marketed to in some way. Um, 
and so it's it's you know less an emphasis on where you are as you said and more on where's the where are the customers located yep absolutely that's a great question though um and why don't we round it out with one uh with one more here um where should where should my team be communicating if we don't want to have anything in Slack or over email? Um, uh, Andy, if you wanna you wanna take that first, or or I can. It's yeah. up to you. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, the best is having PreachRx in place, and you have a separate conversations area. But um, you really need to plan ahead with um, an out of band communication because. That is easily compromised. We were talking about before. You know, business email is the one of the primary targets. So, like, you don't want to be going back and forth over email or or Slack either. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I think about it in terms of like just acknowledging that there is going to have to be some written form of communication among some some groups of people, um, yeah. particularly early on. Right when let's say you're in the middle of an incident and you're trying to like stop the bleeding, like you can't tell people, oh, you you shouldn't communicate. Like you you just deal with what it is. But that's that's where that's where your training comes in, right? You you tell people, Andy, I think you gave the example. Like listen, when you're trying to solve an incident, you don't want you don't want developers being like see i told you we should have installed that patch a year ago or you know yeah, yeah that we've known that this was like a massive exposure for weeks or months or years or whatever like leave the commentary to a different uh, to to a different conversation um because believe me we'll get to that but while you're trying to stop the bleeding it's not helpful right yeah so um so just keep it to the facts what happened what's impacted because those are going to come out anyway like andy like you said with the, the yeah. changes in privilege these days like they're you're not going to be able to cover that stuff so you may as well let them say it let, let them say it in slack and and just train 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 as much as you can and 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 find leaders too like leaders who recognize and understand that like i think there's a certain level of maturity that that you need to find in you know in the folks that are within your tech stack and and maybe it's maybe it's you know as much experience as it is maturity but um you know giving people an understanding of of what exactly uh they might have to be going through when you when you put in when you, when you type something like that in so guess who's going to be yeah. called as a witness right yeah you ever been deposed before you ever you want to like right. most people don't want to that sucks uh yeah you know, a lot of time so anyway andy this has been absolutely awesome it's been been great uh great partnering with you on this and yeah, uh, yeah really, good. Uh, really excited to uh have had the opportunity yeah yeah thank you and thanks everybody for joining this is uh, this was fun all right have a great day